Hello, everybody. This is uh, Professor Pierce, and um, this is the midterm review for my CS152 students. So uh, here we are at the main page for the course, and I'm going to click on uh, I'm going to click on midterm review here. So um, the midterm um, says here will be Thursday, March 12th. That's today. No, uh, the midterm is postponed. The midterm will be Tuesday. The midterm will be, um, will be at the time of our regular class meeting. Um, what is that? Three o'clock. And uh, the midterm will just appear in, uh, will just appear in your Canvas, um, your Canvas feed. Uh, and I will also set up a Zoom session um, in case there are questions that arise during the exam. Um, it says here uh, that it will be on Canvas. I guess I just said that. What I'm uh, envisioning, the, the ideal here would be that all of the problems, there are three or four problems, it says in the next sentence, all of the problems should be able to fit in a single Scala worksheet or a Scala app. So that's what I'd like from you, just a single worksheet or a single app that you're going to upload to Canvas at the end of the, uh, at the end of the exam. Of course, here you'll have internet access, access to books and notes, um, your laptops, of course. The only um, the only thing that I ask here is that uh, there's no communication during the exam except with me uh, through um, through Zoom. Uh, if I detect that people are working together, uh, if exams look too similar, that sort of thing, I won't grade those exams. So. Uh, it's a difficult situation, so you can, you know, do your part by by just doing your own work on this exam. Next topics. Um, so here's a list of uh, just some ideas, some concepts that hopefully you're familiar with by now. Difference between mutable and immutable collection. Um, remember here, a, a mutable collection you can add and remove elements without uh, changing the identity of the collection. Um, for example, uh, uh, you might have uh, the staff of a company as a list of, uh, of employees. Well, you'd want to be able to add and remove um, hire and fire employees without changing the identity of the, of the staff itself. An immutable collection, uh, you can add and remove elements from an immutable collection, but the way that works is you get a brand new collection just like the old collection, except with the elements added and removed. Of course, here is sequence. The elements are ordered and not necessarily unique. Uh, a set, the elements are not ordered, but they are unique. And then a map is a collection that's, I think of it as a two-column table. Column one are the keys. Column two are the associated values. Stream, kind of like a list, uh, it's a sequence. Um, it's got, it's made up of, of cells um, with a head. Each cell has a head and a tail. Um, the head is like the element, an element of the list is stored in the head. But the difference here, the tail of the last element in a stream is a function, which when called will tell you the next pair in the stream, the next element in the stream. So streams can be potentially infinite. Tail recursive function, the recursive call comes at the end of the, uh, of the function. There's no additional work that needs to be done. This is important. This is superior to traditional recursion because most compilers are optimized for uh, tail recursion. Uh, and the way they're optimized is they reuse the same uh, function call uh, activation record on the call stack uh, for the recursive call. There's no reason to keep the old activation record, any of the data in the old activation record. So consequently, um, they use a constant amount of memory regardless of how big the input is. Polymorphism. It means 
means an object can have multiple types. So we see this is true when you have, uh, when you have an inheritance hierarchy. Um, an object that's an instance of some class at the bottom of the inheritance hierarchy can substitute for uh, objects at any of, the, any of the classes above it. The example we gave in class, we had a hierarchy. Uh, top was an expression class. And then below that, we had sums, products, and numbers. So, so a sum is both of type sum and a type expression. This uh, means that we can do things like data-driven programming. Um, so the, the object decides what function to call, not the programmer. Combinator is an idea from functional programming. It's a higher order function. It takes functions as inputs and it uses them to create a brand new, more complicated function, which it gives as an output. An example being the compose combinator. Some problems associated with variables. Well, the main problem um, is synchronization. In multi-threaded applications, you might have several variables, uh, several threads sharing a variable. And uh, so they have to synchronize their access to the variable. And although there are, uh, there are primitives available for synchronization, um, you know, to uh, to do to write a program that truly has no synchronization bugs in it is surprisingly uh, difficult. Scala's if-else expression is an expression. Java's isn't. Java has this guy here, which is the closest to Scala's, the conditional expression in Java. Uh, the thing is about this is it can be used, for example, on the left-hand side of an assignment statement. Same in, in Scala. So, um, so there's the Scala line. You couldn't do this sort of thing uh, with Java's if-else. You'd have to use this weird if-else condition. Here, singleton is an object that, without a class, these can be used for services. A service is a collection of related functions that aren't necessarily behaviors of some class of objects. Uh, singletons can be used as enumerations, and of course, apps are singletons. Companion object is an object with the same name as the class that it's the companion to. And uh, we can just add extra features to the companion objects, such as uh, test functions and, and uh, of course, usually an apply function that's in there. Um, like singletons, uh, companion objects, um, these, are, these are stored in static memory. Um, most objects live in the heap. But objects in the static memory, they come into existence when the program starts up, so they have global lifetimes. And they're usually public, meaning they have global visibility. So you can refer to a field and a companion object or a singleton object anywhere in your program. Um, what are options? Uh, options are two kinds of options, some and none. Um, these are, think of them as an alternative to throwing an exception. So, um, so if you're writing a function and the function detects a bad input, it can return none. Otherwise, it computes its value, but then wrap, wraps that value in a sum object and returns that sum object. Here I'm asking you to draw an environment diagram, but I haven't quite figured out the technology for doing this um, on Camtasia yet. Um, here, the way I would draw this is a val declaration. So I draw F1 and then an arrow pointing to the number 10. A variable, I would draw F2 and then an arrow pointing to a box containing 10. The box is the variable. 10 is just the current content of the box. And then here I would have F3 with an arrow pointing to a function object, a function object or a closure object, as we call it. 
That's one of those boxes with three compartments in it. The first compartment are the uh, the first compartment are the parameters. In this case, there would be no parameters. Second compartment is the body. In this case, the body is just ten. And then the third compartment is a pointer to the defining environment, which is not really shown here, but presumably it would be the global environment. These are some, some skills that you should um, have under your belt before you take the, uh, the midterm. And then down here we have the sample problem. So list processing using iteration, recursion pipeline. So do you remember, I'm going to go over here to lectures, Scala programming notes, List processing in Scala. Scroll down a little bit. Uh, this example, uh, signal processing. Remember this example, I had defined a note class here. Okay, um, now we haven't studied this yet, but when you write the word case in front of a class declaration, um, among other things, one thing that does is it auto-generates a uh, companion object with an apply method in it. Uh, and then a note has three fields, amplitude, frequency, and duration. Duration has a uh, default value of 1.0 if it's not specified. And down here, Symphony 1 is a list of notes, and one of the notes in the symphony has got a negative duration, and our assumption is that that's a bad thing, right? That probably means that the, um, you know, that there was a pop or a hiss or some static, something like that. So it's not a real note. Um, and so then uh, we wrote this duration function, given a score, any list of notes, it returns the sum of the durations of each note in the score, each good note in the score. And then I showed an iterative, recursive, tail recursive, and pipeline solution. Okay, so, um, so I like that problem. I like it because it combines together some knowledge of creating classes with uh, knowledge of list, with the knowledge if you're doing the pipeline, um, with the knowledge of you know how to use map, filter, and reduce. So, um, so those are kind of problems that you know, I'm thinking about or a problem similar to that. So you might want to go through these, uh, these notes as part of your review. Um, so uh, at the bottom, so I can go through some of these problems. At the bottom here, this midterm review is I uh, posted some solutions to these problems, but uh, I'll talk you through uh, my solutions. Um, just in case. Um, so uh, let's see here. I uh, pasted all of these into a Scala worksheet. Here is my implementation of zip. And the first thing you should do, I think, in a lot of these problems is before you start writing code, make sure you understand what it does, what the function is supposed to do. So let's start here by looking at the sample calls. This one, for example, I've got two lists, one, two, three, and the strings, one, two, three. And then if we scoot over here, the output is going to be a single, no, calm down. The output is a single list, but the elements of this list are pairs. Okay, so just like a picture of zipper, uh, zipping up two columns of, you know, zipper teeth, you know, when they're all sort of, sort of meshed together like this. Here's another example. Um, I've got the string pi and the string e in one list and the doubles 3.14, 2.71 and the other list. Okay, and when they're zipped together, I get a single list containing two pairs. The other thing you should note from this example here is in the first case, it was a list of integers and a list of strings. In the second case, it's a list of strings and a list of doubles. Okay, so uh, zip uh, is, is type agnostic is the term I used in class. 
meaning that your zip function is going to have to be generic. And so up here, uh, zip, I've given it two parameters, s and t. So the first input, list one, is a list of s, and the second parameter, list two, is a list of t. And the output here is going to be a list of this notation here is the type of all pairs, the first element being of type s, and the second element of being of type t. Right, so in this first example, s would be int, and t would be string. Right, and the output here is a list of pairs uh, of type first element is from s, second element is from t. So uh, the way that I did this then was uh, uh, these lists better be the same size. So I check for bad news first. If they're not the same size, I throw an exception here. Uh, next, uh, the lists are both nil. I've decided what I'm going to do. Remember, nil is the empty list. I'm just going to return nil. Okay? I only have to ask if list 1 is nil, because if list 1 is nil, I already know that they have the same size. So list 2 would be nil as well. Um, else, here's where I use recursion. So I zip together the tail of list one with the tail of list two. How does that work? Um, I don't know. It's not really a good time to ask that question um, because it's something that, um, something that you get for free with recursion. It's the beauty of recursion here. So pairs here is almost exactly what I want. The only thing that's missing are the first element of list one, the first element of list two. So here I grab list1.head and list2.head. I pair them together, and then this is the cons operator. The cons operator adds it to the beginning of the pairs list. So uh, pretty easy uh, to do. So uh, do you think this is a tail recursive function or a traditional recursive function? I'll have a sip of coffee while you contemplate that. Here's the recursive call right here. I'm defining a function called zip, and down here I'm calling zip. But am I done? No. I then have to perform this cons operation on the result of the recursive call. So, so this is not tail recursion. Unzip, I'm not sure why that's there. Unzip does the opposite of zip. I think I'll let you work through this yourself. Um, so here I'm zipping together this list one, two, three, and the strings one, two, three, and then I'm unzipping it. And the output of this is a pair of lists. Before, the output of zip is a list of pairs. The output of unzip is a pair of lists. Tricky. Uh, by the way, I think zip and unzip are, are already defined inside of Scala list. Problem two, let me go back and remind myself what problem two is. Um, pipe combinator it takes these two functions, f and g, and returns a new function, h, which is f of t, unless f of t throws an exception, in which case g of t is returned. So let's look at the example here. Um, so two integer is, uh, I'm going to pipe together this function. So this is a function that takes a string as an input and then converts that string to an integer. And this function, um, if the string is not a, a bunch of digits, this function throws a number format exception. You know, if you gave it the string, if S was the string ABC, for example, then this would throw a number format exception. It can't be converted into an integer. And then here's the alternative. So if this guy throws an exception, then use, this is g, use this instead. This is a function that takes any string as an input and just returns 0. So then down here, 2 integer of the string 3, 4, 5 returns the integer 3, 4, 5. 2 integer of the string 3, 4, c well, uh, that throws a number format exception, but we don't see that because pipe's going to catch that exception and instead apply um, this function 
which will just return zero. So uh, this is a good example of a combinator function. Um, make sure you understand uh, the first line of this. Uh, pipe is generic. T and S are parameters. Uh, F is, is of maps. F is of type T arrows S. G is of type T arrow S. And the return type is something of T arrows S. Inside, I'm defining a function H. It's going to call f of t inside of a try-catch block. If this guy throws an exception, the exception is caught here, and instead I apply g to t. And then here I'm returning this h as an output. So then here I define two integer, and here are some several sample calls to um, these integers, to two integer. Great. Um, MaxPal. Um, here I'm asking for four. MaxPal is fairly easy to understand. Um, what's the, uh, the length of the longest palindrome in a list of words? So words, here's a list of string. I'm going to return an integer, the length of the largest. Here, MaxPal, here's this list. Mom, rotator, cowbells, and dad. It returns seven. Well, rotator, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven characters. What about cowbells? Cowbells has eight characters in it. Ah, but it's not a, uh, it's not, it's not a palindrome. And let's see, I had some helper functions, um, is pal. Uh, means that s is the same as s dot reverse. Um, so these are all functions that you know would have been easy to define anonymously. But here is uh, the map reduce solution. Um, so I'm going to filter with is pal. So that stage of the pipeline will um, let's get that box. That stage of the pipeline uh, will filter out anything that doesn't pass this test, the palindrome test. Then map length underscore will convert each word, each palindrome in the list, there are only palindromes at this point, convert it into their length. And then reduce here is going to, um, is going to combine them um, pairwise using the max function. Now, one thing that I'm doing wrong here, and you know, you should probably not make um, this mistake. I mean, the right way to do this would be something like this. Um, Curly braces around this. Oh, not nil. Um, zero. Okay, so so one thing that I've been lax about, warning you about, is that reduce assumes that the list is not empty. Reduce doesn't work if the list is empty. So I can't make this one slick pipeline like I had before, but I have to first ask if it's nil, you know, what should be, what I should do. And if it's not nil, then I can use reduce with it. So that would have been a, a better solution. And here's a tail recursive. I guess it'd be good to go over this. Uh, so my tail recursion sort of imitates iteration. I've got a tail recursive helper function here, which has two parameters, result, this is the answer so far, and unseen, these are the elements in the list that I haven't looked at yet. If unseen equals nil, that means I've seen everything, and so result must be correct. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to tail recursively call helper. Notice that helper comes at the very end. And uh, 
if uh, the uh, unseen, the first element, the head of the unseen elements is a palindrome, then, um, then the first input to the recursive call to helper will be uh, a number, either the, mat, the largest between the length of the unseen head or the result. Otherwise, uh, it'll just be result if the head isn't, um, if the head isn't a um, palindrome. So all of this is just the first input to helper. Right, and that's what I was saying earlier. You can use an if expression in a place where an expression is uh, is expected, and then here unseen dot tail. So we've already analyzed the head of the unseen elements. So what remains to be seen is the tail of the unseen elements, and initially um, the longest palindrome is zero, and the unseen elements is everything. I haven't seen anything yet. Let's look at problem four. So here was this alpha language. Um, so when we talked about traits, I think the example we gave, here's a little class diagram of this thing. So we had two traits, the expression trait and the value trait. Um, Let's see, um, if the expression trait, if you're an expression, you know how to execute yourself, and the result of executing produces a value. And the sum is a good example. The sum has two inputs, operand one and operand two, and those could be arbitrary expressions, you know, including other sums. Literal, something like a bool or a number, it's both an expression and a value. Number and bool, uh, basically are wrappers for um, Scala double and a Scala boolean. Here's some of the code that I gave uh, for this. And um, here we can just take a quick look at sum. Um, sum has operand one and operand two are the fields that are expressions, and it extends expression. So a sum has expressions and is an expression. And then execute, I eagerly execute arg1 and arg2. Now, again, I don't know what operand1, I'm sorry, let me say that again. I eagerly execute operand1 and operand2. Again, I don't have any idea what operand1 and operand2 are, but I know since they're expressions that they will know how to execute themselves. Okay, here I do some type checking. So arg1, if it's not a number, if arg2 is not a number, something must be wrong, so I'm going to throw an exception. Here I'm casting arg1 and arg2 as numbers, and I'm creating a brand new number object, literal number, that, uh, that has inside of it num1.value, remember that's going to be a Scala uh, double, and num2.value, a Scala double, and then this plus sign here is um, this plus sign here is Scala edition. So what did, was it that I wanted you to do here? Um, so here is this code again. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to read the problem again. Uh, so here uh, we've added a new kind of expression, uh, an AND expression, sometimes called a conjunction. Just make sure you understand uh, the syntax here. So I'm ANDing together alpha, the alpha true, that's the first operand to AND, the second operand to AND is another call to AND, which is ANDing together uh, an alpha false and an alpha true. So true and false should be false, and false and true should be false. So we we'll probably expect this to produce the value false when it prints out. Okay, and then here it says implement the AND class use short circuit execution. What does short circuit execution mean here? Let's see. Um, here we have a commented out version of this thing. Uh, 
The comment and out, I just copied what I did for some. I eagerly execute operand one and operand two. I do some type checking. Oh, it should say it should be booleans, not numbers. Did too good of a job of copying some. It should be and inputs. Okay, and, and sum one, let's call it B1 and B2. B1, B2, okay, that looks a little more Boolean-like. So I basically just copied what I, uh, what I did for, copied what I did for some here, did some type checking, cast them as, as, as Scala Boolean, Scala is, no, cast them as, so B1 and B2 are alpha bools. But b1 dot value, that's the Scala Boolean inside. b2 dot value, that's the Scala Boolean uh, that's inside. Remember, let's see if we've got that up here. So value is a Scala Boolean. Okay, the, the trouble with this is came right at the beginning. Uh, operand one, I executed operand one. Okay, now that could have been true or false or something that wasn't a number at all, right? But if operand one was false, since I'm doing an and, well, I know right away that the answer is going to be false, right? Uh, and yet, even though I might know that the answer is going to be false at this point, I doggedly plow ahead and execute operand two. Okay, so um, this could be very embarrassing, for example, like if we're doing something, writing code that looks like this, um, if, um, let's see, let's say we're saying if zero is less than x and, um, and one is less than the square root of x, then blah, blah, blah. Well, here, if x is a negative number, okay, we want to, then, then this whole condition is going to be false, right? Is x, um, zero less than x is false. But uh, what I'm doing in the way that I've implemented this, this would be the second operand. We go ahead and execute that. But when we try to take the square root of a negative number, then, of course, you know, we get some sort of a runtime error. So I don't want to do this at all if, if it doesn't pass this first test, if x isn't a positive, isn't a positive, or I should probably say non-negative, isn't a non-negative number. So short circuit says, well, if you find out that this guy's false, then just stop right there and return false. Don't bother to go on and do this, which is, which is great. You know, I don't want to take the square root of a negative number. Um, so, let's see, sorry, that's the wrong screen. Here's the short circuit version. So I execute operand one to get arg one. I throw an exception if it's not a bool. I cast it as a bool. Uh, if b not b dot value, remember b dot value is going to be um, a Scala boolean. And if that's false, then I'm just going to return arg one. Arg one is you know is also false. Otherwise, if it's true, then I'll go ahead and execute operand two. And, you know, I'll do, I'll throw an exception if it's not a bool. And then I don't even really care what arg two is. If arg two is true, I should be returning true. If arg two is false, I should be returning false. So I just return arg two. This is called short circuit execution. Officially, short circuit execution means execute your inputs, your operands, from left to right until the answer is known, and then stop executing operands. Contrasted with eager execution, step one, execute all of your operands. Um, lift. Let's take a look at lift. What's the problem here. Um, oh, yeah. 
So um, this was a lot of these were problems from past midterms. Um, so here in the alpha language, I have this number class. And really, number class is just a wrapper for, for Scala double. So what I'm trying to do here is somehow smuggle Scala doubles into the alpha language by, you know, putting this number wrapper uh, around them. Okay, um, now um, Scala has lots of functions that map doubles into doubles. And so I don't want to go to the trouble of rewriting all of these functions that are going to turn them into num functions that map numbers to numbers. Okay, so what I'd like to do is I'd like to create a lift operator combinator. Lift combinator takes any function that maps doubles to doubles. Here's our friend, the square function. And it turns it into a function that maps numbers to numbers. So num square is the alpha equivalent of this square function here. And so here I have num square. I apply it to a to a um, to an alpha number, and it returns the alpha number forty nine. Do I really need new there? But we'll take care of that. In the so there isn't much code here, uh, but um, but the idea is 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 big. Let's see, maybe I can copy. Oops, sorry. Let's see if I can copy this code here. Yeah, here we get the the number um, forty nine. Right. So, uh, how does it work? Well, so lift takes a, a function that maps Scala doubles to Scala doubles, and it's going to return an equivalent function that maps alpha numbers to alpha numbers. Internally, I define H. This is the function I'm going to return takes a number as an input, returns a number as a value. And uh, it takes, so I take number constructor here as the companion object. Um, n was a number, so n dot value is a Scala double. Now I'm going to hit that with f. So f of the Scala double is a Scala double. And now I'm going to wrap it up as a number again. So we do that. Uh, quite often when we look at Jedi, you know, we uh, have like something wrapped up as a Jedi value. We uh, unwrap it to get the underlying Scala values. We combine the Scala values using some Scala functions, get a new Scala value, and then we wrap it back up again as a Jedi, or in this case, as an alpha value. Okay, um, seeing how much more of this we have to do. Um, let's talk about uh, problem six. Um, so I like this as well. So here we have um, these two warriors. Um, there's red uh, Sonia is a warrior, and blue velvet is a warrior. And um, here, red dot strategy. I'm setting red strategy to a stomping strategy. Okay, so that when red attacks um, blue, for example, um, red's going to stomp blue. I'm going to set blue strategy. Now, here, I'm going to make a composite strategy. So blue is going to be very powerful. Uh, Blue can, she can spit fire, she can stomp, and then spit fire again. Right? So when blue attacks, she'll spit fire, stomp, and then spit fire. Here, red is going to attack blue. We see red Sonia is fighting blue velvet as the output produce. And there's the stomping taking place right there. And blue velvet's health has been decremented. Now it's blue velvet's turn. Blue velvet is fighting red Sonia. 
And we see the blue velvet spits fire, stomps and spits fire again. And poor uh, Red Sonia, her health is greatly diminished by all of that fire and stomping. Here is the design. This is sometimes called the pluggable strategy pattern. Uh, so I have a warrior class here, and a warrior has a name and health and a method for uh, attacking an opponent warrior. And over here, uh, this is the strategy that the attack uses. So the strategy design pattern uh, basically uh, allows us to um, basically represent algorithms uh, as objects. And so in the strategy pattern, the algorithm for attack would be uh, would be an object, uh, some kind of a, some kind of a strategy object that would encapsulate an algorithm, and I can quickly switch algorithms here. Here, a little bit different, the pluggable strategy pattern. Notice that the strategy is a warrior arrows unit. So the strategy is a procedure that takes a warrior as an input and then produces a bunch of side effects, prints some stuff to the console, decrements, um, decrements the opponent's health and so forth. So uh, Spitfire, here's some strategy. So Spitfire, given an opponent, spits some fire and decrements the opponent's health by 10. Here's Stomp. Uh, stomp um, does some stomping, decrements the opponent's health by 7. And uh, so then uh, what I want you to do here is to create this combinator that takes several of these strategies as an input and produces a composite strategy. Okay, let's see if I did this. Right, and so here's my implementation of Warrior. Uh, the attack method, the strategy is a procedure uh, that operates on warriors. Remember, returning unit. Unit is like void in Java. So we don't return anything. We just produce a bunch of side effects. Here is my attack method. It prints out, you know, some names here. And then it takes the opponent and feeds the opponent to the strategy object. And then coming out of that, it prints the opponent's health. Okay, so... Um, so here, going back to the sample code for a second, um, here, red dot strategy equals stomp. So, so currently, red is going to be using a stomp strategy. Um, but later on, um, later on, you know, I could change this to, um, you know, to, um, to a Spitfire strategy if I want. So I can alter the algorithm dynamically. What about this make composite? Make composite takes a list of strategies. Okay, and uh, here comp strat, this is the composite strategy, which it's going to return down here. For S in strategies, S applied to component. So we're just going to go down this list of strategies and hit the poor opponent with each strategy in the list. And so then that is the return value for this. So uh, I like this problem. It's, a, uh, it's not a lot of code, as you can see, but, but uh, I, I gave this code for you know, spit, and fire, and, and stomping. But uh, the idea is big in here. So it's a big idea, this, um, this pluggable design pattern. OK, let's see. Did I even do 7? Um, seven is this um, weather station, and I don't did I do it? Oh, well, phooey, maybe I didn't do number seven, or maybe it got cut out at some point along the way. wrong here already. I don't like that gray bar. That might be the comment section. Now I don't know what I've done.
done at all here. I guess I have to live with the gray bar. Um, so, oops, 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 oops. Maybe I did it here. No, I didn't do it here. So, bad professor. All right, so let's grab this weather station. In fact, I think what I'm going to do here is um, I'm just a little nervous about, about I am um, a little nervous about my. In fact, I'm so nervous about my um, my worksheet here. I'm going to start a new worksheet. I call it MT three. Okay, so there's um, the entry. So remember, this is like some automated weather station. And it generates a log of these entries. It says what hour the temperature measurement was taken at and what was the temperature recorded at that hour. And then it just has a little two-string method in it. Okay, here is some um, test code. So here we have some readings that were taken. So at 6 a.m. it was 25 degrees. At 10 a.m. it was 28 degrees. At 12 o'clock it was 32 degrees. 4 p.m. it was 30 degrees. 6 o'clock it was 26 degrees. 6 p.m. that would be, and this is what, 10 p.m. Uh, it was 19 degrees. And then what is it that we're supposed to do here? Um, so implement log processor. It takes a list of entries, converts the temperature to Fahrenheit, then removes all entries taken after uh, 5 p.m. Right? So we need to know the formula for, um, so let's call that uh, log processor. And it's going to take a log as an input, and this is a list of entry. The first one we want to do is take that log, and we're going to um, let's filter out everything, uh, all entries in which the uh, all entries in which the time. The hour let's see did it say after five o'clock is it five p.m. Um, sorry I'm gonna have to do a check again here uh, we want to after take it after 17 so 17 that's 5 p.m. right so um, so here, uh, each entry in the log will be plugged into this blank spot here, and then we'll access the hour. And we're testing to make sure that the hour is oh, after 5 o'clock, so it'd be less than or equal to 17. And then uh, furthermore, we're going to convert them to uh, centigrade temperatures. So these... Um, an entry, the temperature is a double. And uh, let's see, so these are centigrade temperatures. So uh, 100 degrees centigrade. Um, what do I do? I think you multiply by 9 fifths and add 32. So let's try that. Um, um, 
nine times underscore dot temp. Oh, no, 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 I don't have to do that. X, um, X is the centigrade temperature um, divided by five. Now, this is going to be integer addition. So I'm going to make this 9.0 and divided by 5.0. And then I think you have to add 32. Um, Thanks, double. And so we need a So these are lists of entries. Oh, goodness, I'm sorry. That's right. So X here is an entry. And it's X dot temp. Here we go here. Okay, so now it's fine. So so I filter out all of the entries. Uh, the hour is less, the hour is greater than 17. So remember, we test for good things. First, so you're good if your temperature is taken uh, at before or at 5 p.m. Okay, next, so now I have a list of good entries, and for each one of these entries, I'll take the temperature of that entry, I'll multiply times 9.0 and divide by 5.0 first. So, for example, if this is 100, then uh, let's see, multiplying by 9 uh, would be, let's see, let's Divide first to divide, doesn't matter. Dividing um, 100 by 5 would be 20. 20 times 9 is 180. 180 plus 32, which is 212, which is the boiling point in Fahrenheit. Right. And so then we could do something like let's take the daily readings. Yeah, those look like Fahrenheit temperatures. And there's one, two, three, four of them here, even though in the original entry, um, there were one, two, three, four, five, six entries there, but two got filtered out because this one was done at 6 p.m. This one was done at 10 p.m. Okay. Uh, and then this color class. So I like that. That's similar to our note. Uh, one, remember, uh, we had a list of notes. Well, here it's like a list of entries. All right, so uh, color. So here, um, uh, color is a mixture of uh, red, green, and blue. I think these are integers. Uh, they're value objects, so they're immutable. Um, and then here's a little demo. Um, so purple one is a mixture, so 240 would be sort of the maximum amount of red, no green, and the maximum amount of blue. So red plus blue is equal to purple. Purple two is exactly the same. Logically, it's the same. Purple one and purple two are physically different objects in the computer's memory, okay? but they are logically the same. Now here I'm asking, is purple one equal to purple two? And it says true. Remember the default implementation of double equals in Scala is physical equality or literal equality. Are they literally the same object? So for the, and, and there we know the answer would be false. So the fact that this is true means that, that you're gonna have to override uh, equals. Okay, next, I've got this map that I've created. I love the way you can create maps on the fly in Scala. So the first row of the table associates um, purple one with the color purple. Next, uh, here's green. The color green is associated with the word green. The color red associated with the word red. So this given a color will tell you the name of the color. And so now I'm going to look up the name of the color purple 2. Now, purple 2 is not a key in this. Purple 1 is a key, but purple 2 isn't a key. But it still gives me the right answer. Okay, uh, why did that happen? Well, obviously because you're going to have to override the hash code function 
that's what happens here. We look up the hash code for purple too uh, to find out you know, where the row is in the table, if it is in the table. And uh, here is the hash code of purple two match the hash code of purple one. You remember the rule in, um, for about hash codes is if two objects are equal, they must have the same hash code. The reverse isn't necessarily uh, true. You can have um, you can have the same hash code, but they're not equal. Now here, um, for some embarrassing reason, you know, I put this code into um, the Scala worksheet, and it broke the Scala. Scala didn't like it, so uh, I ran, quickly ran over and created uh, this um, this app object. Okay, so uh, here's this, uh, this, uh, so when, where's the app? Here's the app down here, test color, with all of that code pasted in here. I have to do print lines here. Um, and then uh, above it, above the app, I've declared my color class. Now, here, this, there are several important things for you to keep in mind here. Color is a value class. Remember we talked about value objects versus reference objects. A reference object, you can change its state without changing its identity. A value object, changing its state, changes its identity. So here the state of a color is the amount of red, green, and blue in that color. Okay, But if you changed its state, if you changed the amount of red, well, that's a different color now. So color, we want that to be a value object, and there's a certain canonical form for that. You must override equals and hash code, and usually two string is thrown in there. The other important thing is that, remember, this class declaration for color uh, is uh, also a constructor for it. So here, uh, I can just write code. So in line, I'm checking to make sure that red, green, and blue are in the proper range. If they're not, I'm going to throw in. Exception. Uh, notice also that they're declared as vowels, not bars. So I'm discouraging people from modifying my color object. Here's a simple version of equals, and something like this is perfectly fine for um, you know for the uh, midterm. Uh, so if, for equals to work, the guy you're comparing it to is of type any. Remember, any is at the very top of the Scala hierarchy, uh, and uh, you know, so the first thing I do is, um, is oh, I should say, let's say I didn't do this quite right. Um, I should have said something like this. Uh, if um, it's not the case, other is instance of color, then false, else, else I'll do this, um, capitalize there, of needs to be capitalized too, I was getting confused between Java and, so the first thing that you have to do is, um, and let's see, there's another test too. Um, well, let's see, so this is a little bit trickier. Um, um, so I guess this is, so we have to do this, if other, Maybe this is what I want. So other here could possibly be null. So I want to check that first. So if that's true, again, short circuit execution, we won't go on to do this, which we, if other is null, would cause the program to crash. So if other is null, I know this isn't null because I'm calling its equals method, but if other is null or other is not an instance of the color class, you should return false. Otherwise, here I'm going to cast it as, as a color, 
calling it other color. And then this is the test for logical equality. The red of other color is the red of this. The green is the green of this. The blue is the blue of this. Okay, and then um, uh, uh, here's my two string. My two string importantly has in it a mention of red, green, and blue. And so then I convert this to a two string and use its hash code. I assume that string has a good hash code function. Notice that because the string has red, green, and blue in it, two colors that are logically equal have exactly the same string representation and therefore will have the same um, hash code. Okay, I have a companion object here. My companion object has an apply method creates a new color object. And then here I predefine, this is a good place for constants, I predefine some, some popular colors, red, green, and blue. And then this is the test code. Let's see if this is going to run. Something happened down here. Um, false. Doesn't seem right. Um, why is that saying false? And then the second one worked, but for some reason the first one is not working. Purple one equals purple two. Um, overriding equals. Let me just try this. Hmm. Hmm. I had thought that double equals, let me try one last thing. Um, oh, maybe this is the problem. Put parentheses around those guys. True. Yeah. Okay. So, it, it was, uh, so I had to, it was basically doing the append operation and then comparing with purple too. So I just needed parentheses around there to make that work. Okay, so uh, that's it for the review. I'll be having an office hour uh, today. I think um, 3.30 was the time of the office hour. So you can ask questions. I'll be checking my email. Maybe I'll try to set up another office hour for... Um, for tomorrow, and then the exam is Tuesday. Uh, thanks for listening.